Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Talking Points, powered by Bodog. I'm in a good mood. I'm Stu Stone, and I'm always in a good mood because I am joined weekly to talk baseball with Bodogs and Canada's, uh, I got to say, favorite manager right now, looking like you could be number one again, Mr. John Gibbons. Welcome back. Uh, it's great to have you number here, Number one? I never was number one. What are you talking well, about? Well, I'm just saying there was a time when you were number one, for sure, without a doubt. And now the new manager, Charlie Montoya, he's starting to feel the grapes of wrath now because the Jays, let's just get off right off to our first talking point. They've been playing pretty much like 500-ish ball lately. You know, they win a couple, they lose a couple, they win one, they lose two, they win two, they lose two. You know, it's they're sort of keeping pace right now with their record as far as what's going on here. How much of that do you think is... Is Charlie feeling that pressure? You know, Steve, for, well, hey, number one, you were, you were always in a good mood. You're very enthusiastic. It's contagious. So, I, you know, you bring me out of the, you know, so Fair it's on. time for me to work back. Now, you know what? You know, I don't really know Charlie that well, so I can't, I couldn't tell you, you know, what his emotions are like. You know, I've heard he's a wonderful guy. You, you, you when you, I see things, I see videos or whatever of him, you know, he's up, he's upbeat, you know, things like that. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how he takes all that that stuff. You know, if he, what kind of heat he feels. Uh, but you, uh, you definitely. We talked last episode about a story when you were guys were playing the Nationals and you heard that something might happen. You know, you've dealt with this stuff in your career. So at this point, like, is there even reason to worry? Because there's like the it's still early people. But when yeah. you're when you're expected to win, you know, now they're expected to win. People want results, right? Oh yeah, and yeah, especially when the Leafs lost, man. Now, yeah. now they're now they're now they feel a little bit of that wrath, you know. Sure, for sure. You know, and, and uh, yeah, when expectations do can do some strange things to people, you know. And, and uh, you know, I, I think I've told you before, a manager has a lot of control, yet he has no control. You know, he, he puts puts them out on the field, gets them ready, but then once the game starts, you know, the, the players play. So. You know, he's uh, he's got to try to hold it all together when things go bad, you know, or when things go aren't going quite as you, like you expected or, you know, maybe there's a little fracture in the clubhouse here and there. I wouldn't expect that out of this group. They seem like a, a group that really, you know, clicks, gets along really well. But that's the manager's job. And, uh, you know, some of them deal with it differently. You know, I I, uh, I like to take things head on, you know, and I, I learned how to kind of fight back a little bit if there was negative stuff you know, thrown at, thrown our way. And I always made sure I protected the players, right. You know, um, kind of insulate them from that. And I, I would take the heat. I think that's what you need to do, but you know, I, I it, it is, it is early. I mean, and the, they're treading water right now, but you know, that that's kind of, that's kind of the, the ebbs and flows of a baseball season. You, yeah. know, you go through, you know, you look at the Yanks and I'm sure we'll talk about them in a minute again, but you know, they got swept that double headed by the white Sox who were below 500 club that, and they're below 500 in a, in a uh, division that stinks in the American League Central. And then the Baltimore, they've had trouble with Baltimore. They got beat by them last night. And they're, they're the front runners. So whether controversy or, or or something else caused that little dip for the Yanks, that's just that's just part of it, you know. He, uh, but there's also kind of, to that point, we and not to shift on you here, but like bad teams beat good teams all the time in sports. Like that's just yeah. the way it goes. Well you, well, you know what, in, in the NFL or uh, yeah, any uh, given Sunday, a week, well, in, in the NFL, you play one game a week, right? Yeah. A bad team's probably not going to beat a good team. But it right? does happen. Yes. Yeah. There's, there's upsets all the time. But, but in baseball, when you're playing it every day, right. you know what, it, all, it all depends. You get a good pitcher on the mound. Anything can you know, happen. Uh, yeah. I mean, it can, even the, the guy they faced last night, Michaelis, right? When I was managing the double, when I got fired by the Royals, I came up to manage the game and uh, manage the Padres double A team here in the Texas League. And I lived at home, my hometown. Michaelis was on my team. He was our closer. And then he got, and then he got called up. And eventually, I think he went over to Japan and, and he, he learned some new pitches or whatever, came back to the States. It's really turned into a hell of a pitcher, a starting pitcher. So that wasn't like e any easy pickings last night. Uh, and, you know, and then, uh, you know, I, I didn't see, the, you know, everything about the game, but I know they uh, they got walked off by. Well, OK, yeah. A walk off Grand Slam is never fun uh, when it's against you, uh, especially when the team only needs the one run and they've already got a run on second base to start the inning. 
But uh, let's talk about that for a second, because there are casual fans or hardcore fans that watch the game on television or on their phones or however people watch it these days. People like me who watch the game and I'm trying to manage the game from my couch, right? So you have, let's just use this one situation from the Jays and the Cardinals that took place uh, previously earlier on in the week. Right. So you're having trouble winning games these days. The offense is not really alive and well over the last stretch, let's just say. You are in extra innings on a lead that you guys had the lead in. You blew the lead, tie game. We're in extra innings. You have a runner at second base, no outs to start the inning, and you have Santiago Espinal is the batter. Is he not trying to move that runner to third? Like, because because he was swinging away. I, I I so so when people are watching the game, they're like, it's easy for us to say watching like bunt him over, get him, get the runner over, and score the run. Like, but that's right. Well, okay, you say instead of swinging away, should he have bunted? Yeah, anything except for a pop fly to shallow well, right well, field. Well, he's been one of their best hitters. I think he right? has. He has. That's why I'm asking you. So it's like so, easy so for me to say bunt him over. Yeah, no, you know, in that situation, and you know, of course, I don't know the team in the ins and outs of the team. Yeah, I think I would let him swing away also. But you gotta you gotta you gotta swing to drive to get drive the guy over. You know you right. gotta hit the ball on that right side, or and you may get a hit and you may extend an inning, but you can't be hooking things. You know, and that, that's kind of what's lost in the game now nowadays when like there's so much emphasis on hitting home runs, right? Strike hats don't matter, all these kind of things, right? In the 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 situational hitting is kind of a lost art. They work on it, but it's it's kind of and it's not even emphasized as much anymore. And uh, the approach, it's, it's all about the approach. Right, is that right. And there's certain hitters in, in that line, in lineup that uh, are really good to hit using that whole field. Like Vladdy Jr. is really good at it, you yeah. know, so you don't have to worry about it. certain guys' swings aren't necessarily geared that way. But I would think it, it, as being a uh, middle infielder, in, infielder type, Espinal would be that kind of guy, you know. I don't, I, you know, I don't know him, but you know, certain guys in the lineups, it's like with Batista, right? Batista might shoot a ball over there by mistake. He, he's a dead pole hitter and he hits his 40 home runs a year. That's not an easy thing for him to do. It's not, wasn't an easy thing for Encarnacion to do. They might miss hit a ball, hit off the end, and, but they try like hell to do it, but it's not what they do. You know, Donaldson was good at it. He could hit it that way, you know? Uh, so you got to take that into account. But I think what the big, I think what the biggest embarrassment in baseball you know, right now is you go to extra innings, they start with a guy on second base. So dumb. Is this little league baseball or what? So I mean, dumb. what are we doing? You know, I mean, we got yeah. we got the play, play home play, we got the slide rule dumb. second piece, we got the, what are we doing? I don't I think it's so dumb. I'd completely like check for people who have been listening to this show from the beginning. You can add another check mark to things that we absolutely agree on because it is so <laughs> dumb, John. Uh and and so you would have let him swing away there. Interesting. And what about people are complaining about managing the bullpen and i'm sure we're going to talk about this all season long till we're blue in the face the manager does go out and make pitching changes and sometimes it works and a lot of times it doesn't it hopefully over the course of a season it balances out but it's been looking lately like these pitching changes are not working out more than they are working out uh why are guys getting taken out with only 80 pitches uh is what's going on there i i i I agree with you 100 percent i i I don't understand. Is it, so the starter got taken out with about 80, 90, 80, 80, less than 90 pitches. Always almost, it's almost automatic these days. Oh yeah. You know, 80, you're right. 80 is the new hundred. Right. Right. Well, you know, if in, in the past, if they played in St. St. Louis nationally, the pitchers would have been hitting and then you could take them out because right. you might have been but right now. Yeah. I, I don't get it. It's kind of, you know, it's, but it's the analytics, you know, taking over and say, well, he gets to this point in the game, this number of pitches or this time through the lineup or this, whatever he runs into big time trouble. Okay. Right. Okay. That fine. We'll keep an eye on it. It doesn't mean you automatically have to do it. He may be pitching. Well, he might be strong that night. He may be facing a cold team. Who knows? There's a lot of factors. That's why And they they say, well, they call that gut decision. No, that's not gut decision. That's you you see with your eyes. My eyes tell me this guy's pretty good. And you know what? Plus, you know, you end up with the way baseball structure now with the, you know, the way they run pitching staffs and, uh, you, you kill bullpens, you know, and, and uh, they're starting, they're starting, I mean, these guys are starting to chalk up some innings now, you imagine two or three months from yeah, now. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, and uh, so, so, you know, the, 
if you're watching a game, I don't care whether you're the manager, the player, the coach, or they're watching it at home, right? You could see when a guy's struggling. You could see when a guy's starting to lose it, right? You know, that does that, you know, that's just common sense. You watch the game, oh, this doesn't look good, you know, if you're right. a baseball fan. Right. So that 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 a lot of times dictates now you don't want to get caught off guard and get get caught late. You know, you kind of got an idea. Maybe when they say analytics says, well, when he gets to this point, he starts having trouble. Okay, when when he gets to that point, then if he's pitching well. Let's get somebody going and keep him guarded. But I feel like there's a lost art. Another lost art is the art of like sending the pitching coach out to talk to the starter and see what's going on. Like, it seems like oh, just yeah. knee jerk pitching right. changes now without any sort of like, I don't know. It just seems strange. Well, that's all. No, you're right. I, but I think everything so much is dictated now as much as it can be. You know, I mean, naturally things change during the game, but if they, if everything's kind of laid out, mapped out, that's my understanding. And you change, you know, you on the fly, whatever you have to do. But in in the, in the no, computer says he should throw right. 82 pitches. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, you know, not not quite that bad, but you know, kind of along those lines. Yeah. There's, and there's then, also- then you know what you know what else happens? Uh then they, then these pitches become programmed. Okay, well, I get to a certain point, I'm I'm done. You yeah, know? It's right. like they program themselves in, in the I, I I think we're never going to see. I think like the bar to get into the hall of fame for pitchers is going to have to lower because the way that this generation of pitchers is throwing, nobody's going to get 300 wins ever. Like that's just not happening. Nobody, no. Nobody's going to get 3000 strikeouts unless they pitch like 30 years. It's not going to happen. It's, it's like Nolan Ryan has those stats because he pitched 7 billion innings. And what about the no hitters in perfect games? Now, I mean, you have to throw right. Usually, uh, quite a few pitches to get there, right? You have nine innings, and, and what you've even seen pitchers now get. They don't pulled. even let you do that. We've seen this season pitchers get pulled during that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so you're you're right. They're gonna, you know, the, uh, you know, they're gonna have to thing. lower it to like 150 wins. You know, yeah, exactly. 1500 strikeouts. Uh, but hey, don't hey, you know, wins don't matter though, nothing. right? Yeah, wins don't matter, and I and to a certain extent, there's a lot of variables that decide a winner. But I will guarantee this, and I. Certain guys find a way to win. Certain guys find a way to lose when they're Listen, on the mound. If you, that's if just you, a fact. But if you win 300 games, you should be in the Hall of Fame. I don't care if the stat oh, what yeah. it means, because that means okay. you pitched in 300 games where your team won the game. That's Exactly. And you're out there. You know, you, 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 you got to stay on the, in, in a game to get a winner a lot. I mean, exactly. You gotta, exactly. But you know, what, you know what it used to be? The, the, uh, the managers didn't want to even go to their bullpen. You know, usually your starters, the team was geared. They had the best right. pitchers, starters, right? And then the game kind of slowly changed where they started, you know, stacking bullpens, blah, blah, you know, because they didn't, they didn't have, I think part of that is because there wasn't enough good starters anymore because they never developed them because, you know, they yeah. limited them, right? So, but pitchers, if you would, if you wanted to take a pitcher out and he's, he's pitching a pretty good ball game or he's, he's got, he's got a win on the line. That's not being selfish. Either. That, that was mentality. They'd fight you over that, man. You, they'd, be, they'd say something to you when you went to the mound. I've been out there, you know. And when you get to the dugout, there, I mean, there, there's there's some there's some John going on between yeah. the edge. Yeah, and you know what? That's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. You want somebody that wants to be out there. Now sure. it's like, you know, I would think. No, I, I completely agree yeah. again. Um, <laughs> one of the moves that happened, and I'm probably getting this wrong, but like just for argument's sake, you know, there's a lefty coming up. He brings in a righty from the bullpen and then the other team just pinch hits and puts, it on, you know, it's like they, they switch it up on him and he already made the pitching change. Like these types of things, like, can they, is that a mistake or is that something that could be avoided or that's just part of the game? You mean there was a le- lefty coming up. And he brought I, I could be getting this wrong, but let's just say for the sake of this conversation, there's okay. a lefty coming up and he brings in a more favorable matchup, bringing in a righty to face the left, right. whatever the case may be. And right. then the manager brings in a righty. Right. Now, well, what, what the, what, 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 you know, the, the, the hitting team usually always has the advantage there because if they make a move, depending on what he has on his bench, you know, he's got two or three extra players. He can, you know, he can even pinch hit for somebody. And they, they, then the, the, the defensive team makes pitching change. To, right. To, yeah. It could go the other way. So that's just part then of the, he, then he can flip it and pinch in another guy for that guy right. to get the favorable matchup, run out of players. But at the end of the game, so uh because people were like know, complaining I, about that on twitter so um that's what i'm interested in finding out like that's just part of the game like that could have gone either way 
Well, I mean, there is strategy to it. I mean, you just, you just can't flip coins, right. you know, uh, but, but a lot of times too, you know, you'll see, you know, you used to be your, your left-handed relievers were really good against lefties, your specialists. I mean, they dominated. Right. That's why every team was looking for them, right? Sure. Now, now that's not always the case. And, and now even through analytics, they'll say, well, this right hander is a better matchup against this left. Right. So that's maybe why some guys go that, that direction. I, I don't know for sure. It, it have to, I know, probably see. screwed up the scenario, but no, no, you know. no, you're not, but no, but, but, but I, I will tell you this and it's, it, it's, I do it a lot more now that I'm not in that hot seat. Right. I'll sit back and I'll go, you know, what I'm watching a game on TV and go, you know, why that guy for that guy, you know, or, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, an experience has taught me some of that. And I also know that, you know what, you don't know who's available, who's not, and, and, and all, all those things. But you, number one, you got to, if you got a good bullpen, you're in better shape. But you, 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 you know, that there's some strategy to it. And, you know, you, you got to keep these guys rested. But there's certain guys too, you know, uh, you know, that's what, that's why they say every, you know, we always heard the argument anybody can be a closer, you know, closer by committee. Wrong. It doesn't work. You know, it doesn't work because that closer is a special guy here, here, whatever. You know, and so you know certain guys, even setup roles. You know this guy in that that even though it's not the ninth inning, he's he's my best guy in that eighth inning. Where it was, you know, so you may go even then, even though the analytics might say, well, this guy's better again. Uh-uh, I've been there. I've seen that guy late in the game. He he can't do it. I don't care what you say. Yeah, and yeah, and, and the way the teams are built now, most teams have a closer, a setup guy, and some teams even have the luxury to have a setup guy for the setup guy. Like exactly. Like, but that's what I mean. You know, if you if you got a good bullpen, in the end, you know you're gonna you're gonna be all right. But you know what? I'm telling you, on good teams, a manager can screw screw things up more often than he can make things better. That's just what. So that's why good teams win, and they sometimes they you know despite and, and, uh, their manager overpower you, man, in the long haul because they got better players. All right, let's quickly look ahead at the Jays' uh, next couple series. Uh, they're heading to the West Coast to take on the Angels for three. Those West Coast trips are those hard. For you guys, it's a later start or an earlier start, depending on whether it's a day game or a night game. But either way, you lose that three hours, uh, or it's earlier there. Are you? How, is it hard to get up for those West Coast trips? Well, I, I, in about the sixth or seventh inning, man, because usually go, you look at your watch. Yeah. I'm usually getting to go to bed right now. And you get, you're out there grinding. Next thing you know, it's extra range. You go, ah, oh. and then you know it does. It does throw off your clock, and it can make it a little bit. Difficult, more difficult, you know. Uh, uh, I always enjoy going out the West Coast because the weather's usually pretty good. But most teams struggle when they go out there for, and that's you know, a big part of it. Probably is a time change, you know. And then you're in like close to Hollywood, or like players going out to ho- in Hollywood. Is it like a New York trip when you go to LA? Uh, you know, I never wanted to know those things. I don't, I don't believe in curfews, and I never, I, uh, I wasn't out, so I didn't see anybody. I will put it that way. But I was. Quick story, when I was playing in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, 1988, I got traded over to the Dodgers from the Mets. And so Albuquerque, it was in the Pacific Coast League and Las Vegas had a team, right? Yeah. The Padre. So we're going to make two or three trips to Vegas a year, right? We'd, we'd go there and we'd never win a game, you know, and there was always like two buses to the ballpark. And uh, on the way to the park, you know, before the game started, nobody was ever on the first one. Everybody took the second one. or And so they get there because they're all beat up from the night before. After the game was over, nobody was over. Everybody was on the first bus out of there to go to the casinos. Oh, that's never, so funny. Never got on the set. Nobody ever on the second one. And so, yeah, they were all out night, you know, gambling, doing whatever. So, uh, I don't know if Hollywood's the same way, but, you know, maybe. Minus the gambling, but there's probably like stuff to do, let's just say. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and Disney's there too. Did you ever go to Disney when you were there? No, I never went to, no, I never went to Disney out there. I went to the, the Disney in, in Florida. Right. Uh, but you know, when I had my kids, and it's like, oh god, it's hundred degree heat, man. You drag your kids around. They're spotting the parents are going. Now, if you're a Toronto native like I was, living in Los Angeles, which I was, when the Jays would come to town, it was the best because I could come sit wherever I want. You know, it's like, like you could come to the Jays game, and there's a lot of Jays fans there. Usually, they they travel well, or the the transplant yeah. Canadians come out well. I can be, I remember being in Angel Stadium, watching the Jays, Canadian flags are out. There's people there, but it's not a full stadium. So you can pretty much go and have the greatest time. I advise uh, anybody listening to go check out the Jays on a road trip. Hey, Seattle, are they going to Seattle? If you go to Seattle, you're not getting a ticket. 
<laughs> that's a I've you've never I've never seen anything like it. It's the most incredible thing. Unbelievable. You know, it it uh, I, I would say do like a big show on that baseball or something. Yeah. It's like because that's like the home team. And if it's you're a Seattle fan, you ain't getting a ticket. I can remember specifically, and we're go, gonna run long here today. I apologize. All but right. I don't apologize to our listeners because we still have stuff to get to, but we're 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 having we're we're going here. Seattle, which we should save for when the Jays are playing Seattle, but a quick story. 2015, you guys are in Seattle. This is when we sort of realize what Seattle is. Like 2015, when the Jays are, are getting hot, Seattle's packed. And Batista hits a home run that I think got clinched, you guys, the American League something, in Seattle. And it was like a home – it was like he did it at home. Like he hit the home run, and it was like the ovation was like – he was at the Dome in Toronto. Do you remember that? Oh, Stuart, you know what? I- I tell you, when I say I, you can't, unless, unless you see it, you can't really imagine what we're, we're talking about here. But you, you, before the game, you're going to the ballpark, the streets are all, all in blue now. They're not in that, whatever you call that color Seattle wears, you know. But it's in, with Jays, this, that, and they all come down, you know, they come down from the West west Coast up there. Or in, and then, then when the game starts, you know, BP, they're out there packed and they're all behind the dugout, all your Blue Jays fans. So it's like you're at home and everybody's trying to get an autograph or, you know, it's it's even crazier than it is when you're at home because they got so many games at home. And then when the game starts, I mean, it's hard to find uh, Seattle fans. Yeah. So, yeah, when, when the big things happen like that, or anything good, that place is, is roaring. And it, you're yeah. thinking, damn, man, I mean, we are like at home. I, I remember you guys you pl- were playing against Felix Hernandez, the great King Felix from uh... – from the Mariners, and like it was all Jays fans except that one row of like the King. The King the yeah. Or something. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm it telling you, crazy. people think, well, maybe they're probably exaggerating. No, we're not exaggerating. No, it was like it's that. The most incredible thing, and in, in, uh, hopefully that continues out there. I think it will. I think it will. Um, all right. Well, the Jays are, are taking on the Angels for three, and then uh, they uh, have the White Sox coming into town. The White Sox, Ooh, White Sox, who are embodied in some controversy these days. Bad guys. Uh, Obviously, you know, bad blood between them and the Yankees, that's for sure. And I don't know if I remember like a Jays White Sox uh, beef ever, but uh, I can't. Well, I, do, well, I will tell you this. We had Maybe a Stroman. Was there a Stroman, Stroman thing? With, with Tim Anderson. I don't remember. Exa- I don't remember exact specifics of what happened, but they were jawing at each other. I don't know if Anderson got a hit or he got a hit a home run or something. He was going back to dugout and he said something to Stroh or, or I can't remember. I have to look it up because I'm kind of curious what's going on right now. That, that kind of makes sense. Like you see, you know, two big personalities, Tim Anderson, arguably a polarizing figure in his own right. Uh, he's got, he's, he's got a big personality for sure. Stroman is not an, he, one thing he isn't is not confident. He's like the most confident human being on the planet. So yeah. I can see those two kind of like don't show him up. They don't show him up, man. Because exactly. you know what? He's been showing up his whole life and he doesn't like it. And he's gonna fight back, you know. I think of a White Sox legend, and when I think of in the last 30 years, if you think of the White Sox, there's only one player comes to mind, right? If you think of the, the White Sox. Mark Burley to me. <laughs> oh, yeah, well the big hurt. We got the big hurt. Craig Thomas to everybody else. But Mark Burley, obviously, shout out. Big shout out. And everyone knows Mark Burley played for the Toronto Blue Jays and was a favorite of yours. Harold a lot Baines. Of, but a lot of, Bainesy. A lot of people don't remember, though, that Frank Thomas did also play for the Blue Jays, and you got to manage him uh, for his little stint uh, on the Blue Jays. The big hurt in the Toronto Blue Jays uniform. Can you give us any kind of insight onto, onto how that went? Hey, hey, Frank was a unique guy. You know, actually, now you watch down here in the States, you turn on TV, he's doing these commercials for this, uh, what is it, the bio something? Yeah. It's not like it's not like legalized testosterone, but it's something you can buy at GNC yeah. or something. Going, Frank, <laughs> Frank's up like this. And I'm going, uh, he, hey, Frank still looks good, man. You know what? I, <laughs> they must pay him a good lot of good I'll have, money. Uh, I'll have what he's having. <laughs> exactly so yeah frank was a unique guy he was in his own he was in his own world uh and you and it was it was hard it was hard to break through that world right he, but he was our dh he'd been around a while and of course he's going to the hall of fame you just kind of let him do his thing right uh but he used to he used to have he had, he had this videotape you know they said it was all, all his home runs he'd hit in his career right and, he, and he'd, he'd sit there and watch it you know so they talk about like mental imagery and seeing good things you know he's watching himself hit home runs, you know, and he hit enough of them. And uh, so we a long video. 
Oh yeah, but we'd see him. We go, hey, Frank's over there watching his Digby tapes, you know. And uh, but it, but it worked. And and uh, I can remember he hit he hit his 500th home run. We were playing in in Minnesota, right? And uh, he hits his five home 500th home run. Well, let me let me before I say that, let me. Frank used Frank was a lot like Batista, you know what? With the strike zone, they they'd argue with the umpires all the time, right? If Frank had this neck, you guys remember seeing it. If anything, it didn't even have to be that close inside. He'd, he'd go like this with his arms and he, it, his, his backside would shoot out, right? And you're, and you're looking at the damn things right at, just almost down the middle of the plate, right? But that was kind of his move. And so then if, if he ever, he didn't, he had such a good eye though. I mean, he, he's one of the, he's a poster guy for, uh, you know, on base percentage, right? So, but he'd come back to the dugout and from the dugout, he started hollering at the umpire. And I, I'm thinking, so I told him, I told him a few times, Frank, listen, don't wait till you get in the dugout to jump on the umpire's ass. Tell him out there, man. No, number one, you're going to the Hall of Fame. Number two, you're so damn big. You know what? Then they, then they might, then they might, you know, do something. They might change a little bit. You wait till they get in here. You know, they're protected out. You know, they, you know, so what? And uh, I couldn't believe it. So, so anyway, we go to Minnesota. He hits his, I think, my first couple of bats. He hits his 500 home run, right? And then it, I think it was his next to bat. He argued balls and strikes. He got ejected. You know, it's like, I remember that. Yeah. Remember that? On the same day, he had his historic home run. I'm going, I guess, so maybe he listened to me finally. I don't know. It was a, just a bad day for that, though. Sorry, Frank. What was it like having him in the clubhouse? Like, was he, uh, was, were the players sort of in awe of him or were at that, you know? I think naturally, you, you know, you see his People grow up. You watch Frank Thomas. Now you're in the locker room with him. He's that right. kind of figure in baseball, right? Yeah. You know what? He really was a good dude, a gentle guy. You know, you look at the guy and you think, he's going to be he's gonna be mean, you know, uh, snot dripping down, you know, breathing fire. No, Frank was a real a real gentleman, you know? And, uh, yeah, and, and guys loved him, but you knew where he was in that clubhouse because he's so darn big, man, and strong and, you know, muscular. Musk. Hell, he could have been a tight end in the NFL, you know? Easily. Or maybe a, or a, a left tackle or something. So, but it, it, it you know, it was an honor to measure, uh, to manage him. It didn't end well, you know, because we started to stop playing him. And uh, how does that decision come to come to be? Well, well, we got him at the at the tail end of his career, right? And uh, I think he signed a two year guaranteed deal, and he had a third year guaranteed if he had a certain number of plate appearances over those two years. So we go into that second year, and he's he's gonna. And I think it was guaranteed for like ten mils. The, the third year and he all he needed was like 300 plate appearances so he was going to get that easy right so anyway but he, he was always a slow starter but this spring training was really slow and he you know he was he, he didn't he didn't look very good right and this is when matt stairs was on the team and so we were having to play we were playing stairsy and left field stairsy wasn't a spring chicken then either you know so he has trouble moving and it was affecting the team his defense because he couldn't move as, as well anymore so so Frank's, you know, uh, DH and he's struggling this and that. And JP Richard, he was the manager at the time. We were going back and forth and say, listen, we got to give some other guys some DH at bats, you know, to save them. You know, we need them, blah, blah, blah. And I said, Frank, scuff them. Blah, blah. And, you know, we, we kept saying, well, you know, it's early. He's a late starter. Stick with him. Stick with him. So finally, one day we got to say, you know what? We're, we're going to have to make a change and let some other guys get those at bats. And he's not in there every day, but he's still our DH, right? So I, he, said, he said, tell him, you call him in, so tell him what you want to tell him. So I called him in. I said, Frank, here, sit down, you know. And I, and I remember I brought Brian Butterfield in there to make sure because, you know, Frank Frank got pissed off at me. He pinched my neck, you know, snapped my neck. And so, but, and plus, I didn't want anything to get lost in translation. You know how that happens sometimes. So Butter's sitting over there. And so I said, Frank, listen, I said, um, you know, you're still our DH, but we need to certain against certain pitchers that you may struggle with. We want to get some other guys at DH at bats and get them off their feet, you know, this and that. Stewie, Shannon Stewart might have come back then too. He might have, that might have been anyway. So he, Frank didn't like that, right? Because in the uh, uh he, he said to me, he goes, This is BS, whatever. He goes, This is about my my money next year. I said, I said, Frank, and, and with all due respect. I don't have a contract for next year for next year. I'm sure as hell not worried about yours. Trust me. So anyway, so he, so he's all pissed off, you know, and it was, you know, it was, it was, it was a good team decision. It wasn't like we we're right. And he says, well, I want to talk to GM. And he said, okay. Well, I said, well, yeah, okay. Get, get with JP. You guys to talk. So he contacted JP. They met the next morning. We had a day game. JP gave his release, you know, cause he wanted it out. And then uh, I think he, then he ended up finishing up with Oakland. I think he went out to Oakland. Yeah. That's a that story. Right? That's a sad ending to the story, but at least you got that 500th home run game. 
Well, yeah, yeah. Hey, you know what? You know what? The toughest thing of all those two is uh, when you that's manage. That's a legend. You know, that must be that, that, that's, that's hard, hard. Working to have to do that to, to somebody like him, I would imagine. Right. Not that it's hard to do to anyone, but, you know, to yeah, say well, at the end. Sad. Yeah, I've, I've always heard that. The hardest thing to do is, is, is to manage a, a fading superstar that's at the end. You know, everybody get, every, it catches up with everybody, right? And some of them hang on too long and, you know, they're whatever it is. And they, they don't, you know, they've been so good for so long. They're frustrated with that. And, and you know, it's hard, it's hard to tell them that, but that the game, the game keep one thing that's certain, the game moves on with or without us, right? Yeah. And sometimes yeah. you can make tough decisions. Well, Frank ended up having a pretty good twilight to his career anyway. He had a resurgence in Oakland and uh, good for him. Hall of Famer, Frank Thomas. Man, he's on, by, he's by hey, Hey, yeah, but he's not only is he doing those commercials, but he, he does some network TV and he's actually pretty good on there, yeah. you know. I it's amazing that the, he the, how much fabric it takes to make his suits. Oh, <laughs> well, 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 hey, that's a big guy, man. Yeah. <laughs> he would, uh, he would, put, he would put, put my head between his biceps for him, just like a walnut cracker. Just going, <laughs> uh, let's go to our Twitter contest winner of the week. Uh, we will be doing our new contest here at the end. But uh, we did have a winner last week. A hundred dollar winner uh, went out to a gentleman by the name of Ron Nicole. At Ron Nicole is our winner of the hundred dollars last week. And here is his question for you, Gibby. And we kind of already talked about this, so this will be kind of easy to answer. What are your thoughts on Manoa at his low pitch count getting removed after eight on the weekend versus Cincinnati? So we kind of talked about that a little bit, but Alec Manoa specifically, a young gun, should he be on a strict pitch, pitch count, or is this a guy you want to teach to throw as long as he, you can get him to throw? Well, you know, you know, I, I saw the highlights in the, in the, you know, I don't know if he was actually mad, but he was there was a little, he was arguing a little with Charlie and Pete Walker was down there when when they took him out. And how many pitches did he have? Uh, I, I mean, he's still low, right? But, but he, was, he was cruising, right? Was uh, no, I see. I, I love that attitude. You know, uh, you know, Char, I, I saw where Charlie said, "Well, you know, I got the best closer in baseball, so I get that too." But I, I, I think that with that mentality, he's only going to get better and better. And there's and there's going to come a time where he's got to give him that shot, right? Because if because if he's still going strong, there'll be an argument. Well, you know, is he is he, is he better out there than Romano is? You know, that's kind of you know. Sure. And, 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 and Romano is really, really good, you know. Uh, but you look back at, I look back at Roy Halladay. Roy, you know, the, the things that people loved about Roy in, in uh, you know, then it is uh, what he became known as in, in Major League Baseball as a pitcher is his, how far he went into games, how, his complete games. You know, he was, he was old reliable. He was kind of that old school guy that, you know, you give him the ball. In you know the bullpen yeah, loved him because nights off. So, but you you got you got to groom and develop those guys. And, and uh, sometimes you got to give them a chance. You know, uh, you know maybe if if uh, I don't know maybe I just don't know if we're gonna see complete games as like no they, no it's no not gonna happen no because because you know you know what's gonna happen now with the, the analytics right now that uh, you know if Charlie leaves him in that game and he coughs it up or something, they're going to, you know, they're going to be upstairs yeah, yeah. and they go, see, we told you so that kind of, you damned know, if you do, damned but, if you don't. Yeah, exactly. You know, so I don't know. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got a, uh, hopefully that helped you out there, uh, Ron. Uh, if you're watching this now though, it's new contest time, talking points. All you got to do is reply to the tweet that you are seeing this on and uh, you can reply with any question you want to ask. John Gibbons by using hashtag talking points. And if we pick your question, Gibby is going to answer it. And someone is going to win a major league baseball official fitted cap <laughs> team of their choice. Hey, I told you, dude, I want one of those caps. I should, you know what? If I got to answer the question, should I get one of those hats? Dude? You should. You, should I, have, you, I can, know. I'll, you know what? Send me one. I'll wear it during the show. You know, that's that get a little more advertisement. That's not a bad idea. You can send me the hundred bucks. Send me a hundred bucks. Is it U.S. or Canadian though? We'll we'll work on it. It's still being negotiated. Uh, so if you guys see this, reply. If you want to ask Gibby a question, anything's on the table. He is not shy, guys. So come on in and join the fun on Talking Points. And that'll wrap. Yeah, I guess up. before we leave, though, okay. we're talking about Frank Thomas and the White Sox. Yeah, my greatest White Sox of all time was Martin Burley. Yes. 
Well, you've established that. And uh, speaking, of, hey, speaking of complete games, he's got he's got a no hitter and a perfect game in the big leagues. Is he? Are you somebody guys? Still, had, are, somebody are you, had to let him throw it, right? Are you guys? Uh, are you guys still tight? Now we'll text every now and then. You know, I need a good laugh. Or, you know, he's a big hunter, and every now and then, you know, I get him to send me a you know picture of some of the stuff he's he's hunted. You know, feels like he's a guy that could still pitch if you needed him. Oh yeah, his style of pitching, yeah. You know, he's like one of the old timers, man. They just crank it up, they get well, out like, of shape. Fastball's like eighty four. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's got that. He's got that golden arm, man. To do what he, you know, people. I, I, if there's one guy I promote, it's this guy. But I get fourteen straight years of two hundred plus innings, almost fifteen. Fifteen, exactly. Uh, how many guys? We, we. This is a trivia for next week. How many guys last year had two hundred innings in the big league? I, that's a good question, and I bet uh, the I bet you the answer is very. I get bet the answer is very short. Yeah, so you know. Do you want me to pull that up for you so we can leave on a good note? Yeah, can you? Let's okay, see. Hold on. Yeah, we'll be you are a computer whiz. Yeah, I got it. 2021. Let's take a look. Complete game uh innings. Uh let's see. They don't even offer. Oh, here we go. Uh the answer is huh, four. Four. Scherzer, does it list them? Yeah, it lists them, and he's not one of them. Uh, who, who are the four? Zach Wheeler with 213 innings. Oh, okay. Walker Bueller, 207 right. innings. Adam Wainwright had a real bounce back season, 206 hey, yeah. innings. And uh, a youngster uh, who's lighting the league on fire, unfortunately, for a team that nobody pays attention to, Sandy Alcantara. Mar- Marlins. Yeah. Hey, hey, Wainwright's one of those guys, you know, he's older. He still figure out a way to do it. If you if you go to take if if Wayne Wright's got a got a lead or he's pitching a pretty good game late in the game, they try to take him out. I guarantee you that he's fighting them. That's what I'm talking about. That mentality, you know, and that's what it's great to see out of Manoa. You know, now now the, the manager makes a decision. You got to live with that. I, I you know, but, but that's the mentality you want out of these guys. You don't want to beg him to take you. I take me out, so I got the. Uh, you know, so, I, so I'm guaranteed to win if we do win, you know, that kind of crap. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, in 2020, uh, Lance Lynn led the league in innings pitched with 84, but that was also a COVID shortened COVID. season. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, hopefully everybody has a great week and you'll join us again for another edition of Talking Points Powered by Bodog. Don't forget to use Bodog for all of your baseball action all season long. Gibby, we will do this again next week. Stewie, can't wait, man. Have a, good, have a great week. Everybody out there, stay tuned to them Blue Jays.